and we are live. Welcome everyone. Uh, we are Tech Excellence. My name is Daniel Moka and I will be the main host of this event today. Uh, let's get started. Uh, we are Tech Excellence. Our vision is to raise the bar of technical excellence across the world. Uh, let me uh, present you uh, our, uh, our organizers and speakers. Uh, we have, uh, first of all, uh, Valentina Tupac. Uh, she is our founder and organizer. Uh, next to her, we have Alina Liburkina, also a co-organizer of these events. Uh, after that, Oliver Ziller, co-organizer. And last but not least, me, Daniel Moka, also co-organizers. As you see, all of us are here. So today we're going to have a great session. Uh, yeah. Here are our speakers from the past and for the future as well. Uh, so far in 2023, we had really good and uh, informative sessions. Uh, all of them are recorded. You can find them on YouTube, uh, check them out. And also for the year, we have really great and exciting sessions planned. So stay tuned. Uh, yeah, so we can uh, we are available on a lot of social media and platforms uh, such as Meetup, YouTube, uh, LinkedIn, Twitter, GitHub, and last but not least, we have also a great and active community in Discord, which is free. So if any of you is uh, wants to join, feel free to join to us. Mm, we have sponsors. Big thanks to them, Optivem, and partner partners QA unit. Uh, Tech Excellence learn how to deliver quality software faster. So today, uh, let me introduce the speaker of today. He is uh, Johan Martinson. His name is Johan Martinson from France. He's a freelance technical coach, passionate about code and software design. He's an expert in uh, continuous delivery, test-driven development and refactoring, which leads to the topic of today, uh, which is getting out legacy with 3P, which means protect, prepare and produce. Uh, Johan, welcome. It is a pleasure to have you. Uh, before his, before I hand over the microphone, I would like to remind you that if you have any question during the session, then please feel free to uh, place your questions in the YouTube chat channels. And then at the end of the session, uh, we will dedicate half an hour for all the questions and uh, Johan uh, will answer to those. So Johan, welcome. Uh, the microphone is yours. I wish you good luck. Well, thank you very much. I'm, I'm really pleased to be here at this excellent meetup. Um, and I'm very happy to share uh, those ideas with you. Um, so 3P is um, uh, kind of something I've started by doing kind of naturally. And then as I realized that uh, I was perhaps doing things a bit differently than my colleagues, uh, other crafters, I, uh, I decided to kind of um, debug what was actually happening here. Um, and this is the way I really like working. And I think that we um, should do that more. But 3P being a solution, I like to be go back to what the problem is, what does it address, and what could it improve. Uh, so here goes. If we <clears throat> look at one phenomena, uh, which, is, um, which I've seen at least three or four times in my career, is uh, refactoring as a project. So the code quality went bad, and the de developers were complaining. And so eventually, um, after sometimes years, management allowed them to refactor so that uh, the code would be clean uh, once and for all. And um, this, to my experience, does not work very well. And if we look at the economics of refactoring as a project, or in a smaller scale, refactoring as a separate story. Uh, we have this kind of investment profile where we start to refactor and we don't actually add value as seen by management or clients uh, or users. It's potential value. Uh, we developers might see it, but it's actually we could do features instead. So we're kind of adding negative value, spending money without any value. And this continues for as long as we continue refactoring. This might take, I don't know, two months, three months. And But then we, as soon as we start doing new features, uh, we gain some of that invested time because the new features are easier to do because the code is much better um, and so on. And story by story, we kind of 
get back our investment until the point where we go uh, break even. That is when we've gained as much time on doing stories as we've invested in refactoring. So if we spend three months refactoring, um, we'll get to the break even after many months, maybe maybe a year or two, um, if we get there. And during this time, we developers might appreciate the improvement of quality, but if we look at business people, how will they feel, uh, or clients that want their features, um, they will be uh, a bit frustrated, or they will be worried. Um, they might be convinced because the developers say that it's so necessary. They might be convinced that it should has to be done, um, but they might be very suspicious also. And I think the reason is that I mean, as I said, uh, probably the code has gotten really bad before they actually allow, allow us to do that. Because if you look at it from an investment profile, it's not a very um, tempting investment. You know? I'll refactor for three months, and then over the course of a year or two, uh, you'll get that money back, and and it'll be great. Um, <laughs> that's not what investors would call like a, a good bet or a good investment, um, let alone how they will measure uh, the su success of that. Um, but that um, an investment is only bad if you compare it to something else. Um, and uh, it certainly can be a solution in some cases. But compare that to another common way of doing refactoring, which is refactoring at the end of the story. So this is where most of refactoring is done uh, once we've finished the story and, and we know how the code, sh code should be. Um, and so the payback of this investment, it comes much closer. It comes when the next developer uh, needs to change that code or needs to read that piece of code that we refactored. But nevertheless, when we finish the story, instead of jumping to another story, we actually spend time adding kind of negative value with the hope of getting it back later because we will uh, have to get back to that code uh, later. And um, I mean, it will not be a good investment if we don't come back to that code. Uh, and we can't really know that, right? Um, it won't also be a very good investment if, if the refactoring that was done was not very useful for the next story. So there is a, some uncertainty uh, linked to this. But still, I mean, uh, I'm not saying that refactoring at the end of story is bad, only compared to another version of refactoring, which is preparatory refactoring, it's quite different. So preparatory refactoring is in front of a story. Um, the code is not great. Uh, so I might take some time to clean up the code before I add the feature. Um, here, the, the value is certain because uh, we know that what the feature is. So the refactoring is, is, is fit for the, for the job. Um, another good thing is that while I was doing refactoring at the end of story, uh, the beneficiary of that refactoring would possibly be another developer and not myself. So that depends on me being either altruistic <laughs> or, uh, or it depends on me um, actually loving refactoring, which is my case, but I can't really count on everybody else to love refactoring. Uh, so if I have to be, count on them to be altruistic, uh, well, then maybe I might be a bit um, uh, disappointed because maybe they're not, uh, maybe they're not more than me. Um, so the, um, the preparatory refactoring, I'm the beneficiary of the refactoring, so I I'm, I'm have a lot more motivation for doing it. Uh, and the payoff comes much quick, more quicker. Um, so if we compare these versions of refactoring, not that they're completely comparable, I, I admit that, but the more we're able to do the things to the right, the more, um, the better investments they will be. 
And if we get better investments, then um, then we can do more of it. Then we will choose to do more of it. And also, while to the left, we kind of have to ha um, ask permission for, for doing those investments. To the right, uh, we don't really have to do that because it's, um, or to at least a very much smaller degree. So how could we find ways of doing more of the things to the right? Because the more of just-in-time refactorings, the better the state of the project. So this is where uh, 3P comes in. Uh, it comes in to solve, in particular, this problem of how to do more refactorings just in time. And 3P is, as, as uh, Daniel said, protect, prepare, and produce. Um, now, there's a few surprising things inside this 3P, and this is why this presentation is here, uh, in particular in the protect phrase. But let's take a very simple example to get a taste of what it is. So let's take a, a feature. We have a software where that is actually uh, able to print uh, receipts. Now, we do have a CSV and a text uh, receipt, but we want to also print a uh, HTML receipt now. Now, the problem is that uh, as the code is right now, the, the calculation of, I uh, will print every item like right, on a line. And then we actually have to calculate the total as well and, uh, and the VAT. And that logic is duplicated and mixed with the formatting logic in, in both versions right now. So before that, what we'd like to do is a preparatory refactoring. Uh, only we don't want to do a preparatory refactoring if we don't have tests. So we start with tests. Now, this is an easy version. Um, we just set up uh, some, some data. We call the function. There are no dependencies, simple example. And we might actually use approval tests to assert the full text because Either we quickly write a test like that, or we write tests like this, which is not bad, but it certainly takes a bit longer. So there is, there is a bit of a time save where we could do with the approval test. Now, we'd write a few tests like that. It's very quick. And um, they're not exactly very good tests, but that's not a problem because once we are protected, we can uh, prepare. And in the prepare phase, we do two, two things. We, um, we redesign the code so that the new feature will be easier to implement. That's preparatory refactoring. And because that's often quite similar to um, preparing the code to be tested at a more uh, maintainable level, uh, sometimes more unitary level, uh, what we can do here is we can actually use normal assertions and not approval tests for uh, the logic of calculating total and VAT. And then we can uh, keep the text-based test for, for uh, things like the formatting. Um, and it's because we've extracted that logic that that way of testing becomes possible. Now, in the last phase, uh, we can just TDD the HTML receipt, probably with like a single test or something like that, because the, the pricing logic, we don't have to do that anymore. Um, right, so first tool for useful for CP or for testing legacy code is approval testing. So approval testing is the thing where we have, um, we use automated assertions for uh, strings and other things like bitmaps. Uh, so it basically takes off the time that it takes to write um, full assertions of all the data, all the output that we have. Uh, it leverages uh, external diff tools. So it's a record replay mechanism where you first time you run it, uh, there's no reference. You just do approvals, uh, verify result. And uh, it will display the, the, um, the result in textual form. You just save that to a file to say that this is my reference. And then when you rerun it, it will compare the result to the reference. You commit the reference to the to the code. And, uh, and, and so you don't have to actually write the assertion. 
Uh, there's various ways of treating with the different types of data, uh, but basically you kind of stringify the whole thing, uh, possibly customizing how it is stringified so to get uh, maintainable assertions. In particular, um, scrubbers, like imagine that we had a date and the receipt. Uh, if we run that a second time, it will not produce the same date. So we can solve that by injecting a date provider, but we can also uh, very much faster uh, use a kind of uh, uh, normalization of those dates to say that it's date one or uh, it is a date uh, and maybe that's enough. Yeah. Uh, and you can do that for UIDs, et cetera. Right, so that's approval testing. It's a really nice thing that I use a lot for legacy code, um, but that's not very new. Now that we've seen this first example of uh, 3P, and that um, we've seen that it kind of improves the, the investment value by uh, doing shorter and more um, uh, rentable, more um, um, investments that pay off earlier. Uh, well, there's a second thing to it. If we look at a concept which is called value of information, um, it's, it's really interesting. I don't think we pay attention to this usually. So an expected gain of one action, like if I want to refactor something, it is the probability, some probability that my refactoring will add some value. And, and then you deduce the cost of actually implementing that refactoring. So let's look at uh, two scenarios here. Let's say that we have some way of measuring this. Uh, I mean, we don't have, but let's say that we have one refactoring. It has a likeliness of 50% to add 1,000 in value to the project. The cost of doing it is 200. Then just mathematically, the value of doing this refactoring is 300 because it's 50% times uh, the value minus the cost plus 50% times the absence of value, uh, but we still pay the cost 200 and, uh, and the, the result is 300. Another way of doing this would be to pay to know whether it was uh, valuable or not. If we had a way of paying say 50 uh, and then be certain whether it uh, brings value or if it does not bring value, that changes the equation by re actually removing the the cost of doing if it's not uh, if it's not valuable. So the mean weighted value passes from 300 to 350. That might not be much, but still as we paid some money, uh, we're still anyway in another way uh, getting more value of it out of it. Now let's look at another case where the value of, of, of knowing is much higher. In this case, there is a 70% chance that it's 1,000 in value, but there is a 30% chance that it's actually a penalty because maybe the refactoring is not going to be helpful for the next features. We don't know that yet, but um, and if it's not helpful, then it's going to reintroduce introduce complexity, maybe some more generic stuff. They will stay there for the duration of the project. Um, and this is not hypothetical. I've, I've certainly done this several times in my career, um, doing some refactoring, making it more general, and uh, and it turned out never to be used, and no one dared removing it. Um, so if we do that without knowing, uh, then the, the value, the mean weighted value is 100 because of the penalty the slight chance that there is a cost to it. Now, if we pay 50 to know, then we can avoid doing it if it proves out to, not to be useful. And so the mean weighted value, all while we're actually investing 50 just to know if it's useful or not, is 510. And that's a huge difference. Now, if we look at this in a visual form, there's a um, left, it's useful, right, it's not useful. Uh, the, uh, the green stuff is the cost. You subtract that from the blue, which is the value, you get 300. If you pay to know, 
um, the yellow is the payment cost. And, um, and as we subtract the green part in the not useful case, uh, then we not end up with more value. The respective case in the second case is paying to no allows us to remove the, uh, the penalty. And thus bring a lot more value. So even though we're not actually doing anything, actually just, just exploring to know if it's valuable is m way more valuable than just doing the refactoring. How's that for a lazy person? Okay, so if there's a lot of value to knowing, is there a ch what are the cheap ways of knowing whether a refactoring is gonna bring value or not? Well, just waiting. <laughs> That's, if that can, or often that costs nothing, or uh, at least it, um, we can wait sufficiently so that it doesn't cost much until we know whether it's actually uh, useful or not. And this is what kind of 3P allows, right? So what should we wait for? Which refactorings should we wait for? Because intuitively, uh, whenever we see something to do, we want to do that. And, and should we avoid all refactoring uh, or not? Well, there are different types of refactoring. I mean, there are many of them, but just for a few examples. So we have the simplification, you know, there's uh, just, the code is just uh, not doing things in the most simplest way. So we can just do that. Uh, another thing is reusing illegal states. So I don't know, if we have a tic-tac-toe game, maybe instead of passing an int for the row and column number, maybe we can pass an enum because there are only three. Uh, so that removes illegal values or Maybe we're displaying a book on a, on a web page. Uh, the page number can never be negative. So if we wrap that in, a, in an object, then we remove the illegal states. And, and we also get a bit better notion of, uh, we don't make the mistakes of having a zero based uh, versus one based page number. And that actually happened to me. Um, and, um, and third thing is encoding knowledge. Uh, like um, extracting a name for some variable, um, extracting a method just to be able to name it, creating a new object that has a domain uh, sensible name. Uh, that is encoding the knowledge that I have uh, acquired in my head and transmitting it in, into the actual valuable legacy of the project and coding it into code. And then there's making, uh, making more extensible like uh, respecting open close principle. It's another refactoring. So which ones are safe to do uh, at the end of a story, for instance, like before we know? Um, well, simplification, that's easy. That's safe. Reducing illegal states, I think that's pretty safe too, because uh, that kind of re removes mistakes that other developers will do. Uh, they have to be less afraid so they can go faster. Um, encoding knowledge is um, is actually reducing the need for uh, the the historic developers to be there. So that's uh, once we have that knowledge, once we have that understanding, if we can put it in code quickly, I think that's very very safe and should be done at the end of the story. However. Making extensible, applying OCP. I certainly did that a lot at the end of the story, but I think it's a really, really bad idea. I think there's absolutely no reason to wait. Um, I used to do it because I was afraid that others wouldn't do it when appropriate. Um, but I think that's a really, really bad idea and I have better strategies, I think, now. So, um, those are refactorings, but um, that's not the only thing that is um, interesting to look at from an investment profile. We also have tests. So what's the investment profile of writing a test at the end of a story? If, if let's say most of our tests, we write them after the story. It's not to say that it's bad, but the value will be um, 
will be um, achieved once we actually touch that piece of code again. And that test uh, allows us to not introduce a bug. And um, that is sometime in the future, if we come back to that code. And given that it was a good test, that uh, even, even in front of the new story, it actually remains uh, valid. Now compare that to uh, tests at the start of the story. Uh, I mean, there's um, it's immediate feedback. It is certain to bring value. Uh, and I don't have to trust my um, friends being altruistic uh, about it and writing the test for my good later on. I actually write the test for my own good. So that's much more interesting. So if we can move more test writing from end of the story to start of the story, then which one is more efficient? Of course, uh, start of the story is more efficient. And uh, what about uh, if we uh, um, replace the, um, the story with micro increment? So test at the start of a micro increment, then we end up with TDD which is, I mean, so this is by extension, TDD is a very economical way of writing tests because they are written as soon as possible. And so they run a maximum amount of time. And so they, um, they, um, they allow us not to do, um, not to introduce maximum of bugs, but the uh, earlier we write them, the more value they bring to us. Okay, you probably knew that. Um, the um, and there's another aspect to this also. If we write the test at the end of the story, uh, if they are not great, like say we write a test which is full of mocks and, and it's actually like completely, um, completely we have to change it completely once we do a new story or once we want to refactor, we have to change them completely. They're not bringing a lot of value then. Um, and uh, when are we going to learn that those tests were not good? Well, we will learn once the next developer uh, uses those tests and, and realizes that, that those are bad tests. If, if that other developer is, um, is not too polite to be able to give that feedback to us, but aren't they going to be polite and not tell us just? Or are they going to think that uh, tests are necessary? Good, necessary are necessary. So um, you know that just you just have to live with bad tests. You know. Um, so from a learning perspective, writing tests at the end of story, it it basically cannot be worse because you get delayed feedback, and sort of no feedback. Actually, I think that if we allow ourselves to uh, to completely question tests and say that, okay, are the tests actually helping us when we refactor or when we add features uh, and not taking tests are good for granted, then I think we'd end up with a le lot less uh, bad tests. And and me personally, uh, I'd had, I followed the mockest style for a few years and uh, quite a few years. And I uh, probably if I wasn't busy, um, kind of um, thinking that tests have to help, we have to have tests and so on. Uh, perhaps I would have um, switched a bit earlier or I would have improved my test a bit earlier. But I, I certainly see this a lot that um, out of uh, discipline, people write a lot of tests uh, without unnecessarily um, allowing themselves to criticize the value that they actually bring them to. It's not about do the tests bring value, it's it's do the way we do the test bring value. All right, so um, 3P, let's come back to that. And let's take another example of uh, predict prepare for use. So this is a kata uh, that is available on, on GitHub and in many languages. A, its particularity is that it has dependencies. So it depends on a database. Um, and, um, and that's why it goes very well with 3P. The, um, 
uh, 3P, well, what we have here in the lift bus kata is we have one rest route that uh, well, we want to reach route that calculates the price of several lift passes. And we have um, already have a rest route that allows to calculate the cost of one lift pass, which is cool because then it'll be a piece of cake to do this. Uh, we just call this 10 times and, and, and we're done, you know. Um, that would be if it wasn't um, uh, designed in a very strange way. So what we have here is the implementation. And at the top, we have a rest mapping. So this is RAM mapped to the route prices. We have an anonymous function that you cannot call uh, without passing the through the REST API. Uh, in this controller, we have uh, SQL, direct request to the database. And we have a lot of logic about the uh, holidays and, and calculation, calculations of the cost. At the bottom here, uh, depending on the age and stuff, um, we calculate the cost and we set the response. So we could do serialization logic right here. I mean, unit testing this thing is, is you know, complete, uh, completely crazy. Uh, it makes no sense So uh, the way it is designed right now. So it's not useful to working with tests first, but we want to refactor the code, but refactoring the code without tests, it's not very really convenient either. So what we can do is it is easy to test. We just provide a database running yeah. on a local machine. We just spin up the application. We hit the REST API and with our testing framework and we assert the results. Um, I mean, that might pose some maintainable maintainability uh, issues, but as far as we're concerned during the protect phase or the prepare phase, this will allow us to refactor the code and uh, safely. And let's look at the maintainable, maintainability issue later. So this is what I do. Um, and then in the prepare phase, I would extract the calculation of the cost into a function, thus preparing the, the new feature where we just call this function several times. And this is kind of similar to, um, now, now that we've extracted this function, it becomes unit testable with the like, uh, all the domain concerned are preserved. And so we can just adapt the test that we wrote in protect phase to the new extracted interface. And we've been protected all the time. So now the test become maintainable. So conceptually what we've done is we've taken this uh, big piece of thing that did everything HTTP to uh, database lookup and we split into a controller, a data access layer, and use case, and maybe some other artifacts inside the domain. Um, and <clears throat> once we have that, we can actually test the domain in separation. Now, in the produce phase, it's a piece of cake. We just TDD, a multiple uh, pass cost um, function, uh, and then we uh, TDD a REST route that uh, actually calls this function, right? So generally, the produce phase is kind of piece of cake. Now let's uh, deep dive into this protect thing here, because uh, that's that's really the key and, and the, the the main change. Um, what we really want when we are protecting is cover all cases and capture all behavior. If we have that. Uh, then we can safely refactor. We can compromise on a lot of things, uh, stability, isolation. It can work on, on my machine, even readability. Those are compromises that we can do to write uh, tests very fast, very fast. In fact, what we really want is quick and pretty fucking dirty tests. Mm. So let's look at those compromises we can do. What is what is the value of a test in the phase of protection and preparation? Well, we need coverage. We certainly need to capture all side effects so that with this, we know we don't break anything. However, other qualities that are traditional to testing, 
um, are less important. Do they have to be sub-second? Yeah, it's nice, but if they take two seconds to to run, and maybe I wrote 20 tests to cover uh, the piece of code I wanted to change, um, that's OK. I can live with that for a few hours. Uh, I can live with that maybe for a few days even, if that's necessary. Uh, so I certainly won't invest too much time in having really fast tests. Uh, the second thing is stability. I mean, if they break every run out of 10, uh, every one, once out of 10 runs, uh, that I can live with that too, because I run them so frequently that if they fail because they're flaky, I, I probably know, you know, I can just do control Z, rerun them until they pass again, and then do my modification again. Um, so that's not a real problem either. The um, stability regarding external data changes, what we could do is we could actually uh, not mock uh, calls to external services, uh, etc. We might not actually have to go through the work of, of mocking out those things, because um, external data will not change probably in the hours that we're doing that. And if they do change one or once or twice, that's not a real problem. We can just update the tests. That's a maintenance cost of the test that we can accept. Uh, it would not be nice to have, uh, but um, it's okay. Now, readability. I mean, who cares? If I don't get lost in my tests, or if my pair does not get lost in the tests, we don't need readability at all. Uh, actually, that would be a complete waste of time, uh, wasting time on readability. In fact, we don't even have to understand our tests because we're only concerned with preserving existing behavior. So if they fail, we try something else. The um, readability is completely out of scope here. Now, uh, does it have to run on another machine? Uh, probably not, uh, which means that I can I can do some manual setup on my machine to save a lot of time. Uh, eventually, it'll have to run in the CI, but the tests will uh, be refactored before that. So let's not care or spend any time on making it runnable on, on another machine. Also, um, there's one real pain with tests is when uh, when one small feature means that we have to um, update 50 tests. That's uh, that's a real maintenance cost. Um, however, we don't have to be concerned about that right now, because in the protect and the prepare phase, we are not introducing any new features. And before we go into uh, the produce phase, we will have to change the tests. So that's a concern for later. So those are compromises that we can do. But in fact, it's more than compromises, because if we look at different types of tests and, and what they bring to us in terms of uh, uh, features, if we look at the columns, like isolated tests, that's that's really important. They should be fast, they should be stable, no I.O., and so on, um, or at least a minimum. Uh, versus integrated tests, they bring some value in the sense that they are actually talking about the real deal. Uh, we can be surprised about the behavior of external systems, we can know that it actually works close to what it will work, how it will work in production. So they have some value too. Um, the uh, If we look at the rows now, we have a high level test versus lower level test, um, or coarse grain test versus uh, fine grain test. The high level tests are often more useful for refactoring because, because they're testing a big piece of code, we can refactor everything inside. Whereas lower level tests, if we want to refactor something that goes um, uh, out of the frontier that is tested, then those tests, not only don't they, do they not help us, but they hinder us because we have to change the test at the same time. So these lower level tests are way better for uh, changing behavior because when we add new behavior, uh, low level tests will usually not fail or not as much as high level tests will. So there are trade-offs. And when we are on a legacy code base, uh, where maybe the design is not great, uh, probably not because it wasn't designed that way, 
um, and we want to refactor things. What we want is is high level tests, and uh, and we want to have the real deal. We want integration with real services because um, uh, maybe we want to change the interaction with them or or how we how we call them. So the ideal place to be is actually with integrated and uh, high level tests. Um, and as we go on, as we refactor and create the frontiers and create the hexagon and stuff like that, then we will maybe go into um, lower level tests, uh, integrated or not. And um, uh, because we want to change behavior because in the produce phase, we want to uh, be able to change behavior and not have tests that fail for every new behavior. We also want them. Um, uh, very much faster test as we go on. Uh, with faster tests, we will be more efficient and so on. But the ideal place to start is in that upper level where we would traditionally call those really bad, uh, bad, bad tests. But they're not bad. They're just very, very good at a certain stage. Now, that was a lot about the protect phase. Prepare phase. We're doing a preparatory refactoring. The idea being that the new feature will um, be introduced in an elegant and an easy way, um, as if the design was made for the next feature. And we also uh, make the code uh, testable in a more maintainable way, uh, in a more unitary way, and uh, with less IO often. And thing is that those things are uh, often quite similar because the the uh, what we need to introduce a new feature uh, in a subtle way is probably a bit of configurability. configurability. Uh, what we need for having a more a testable code is a more configurable code where we can suppress one behavior uh, to be able to focus on on another thing. Uh, so the configurability is, is very, very similar between the two needs. And that's why those things uh, go very well together. Now, the, uh, I'm certainly not the only one to have said that. And there is uh, uh, very intelligent people who have said it many times in different uh, shapes. And Ken Pex, he says, it, if we do, instead of just doing a change, we make it easy first, and then we do it. Uh, what happens if we um, do that for every story? We'd end up with sort of a framework that was optimized to make it easy to do the features that actually are demanded. Like, like the perfect software for, for the business problem that we're solving. Um, so preparatory factoring is very, very important. The, um, the produce phase, it's it's very easy, actually. It's just implemented uh, using TDD. And the thing is that no matter what the state of the project was before, being able to do TDD uh, on any story is not, not only like theor theoretically possible, but it actually makes sense to do it because we've transformed the code so that um, uh, the business behavior is capturable at a TDD level, right? Last example. Um, this is a recent example for me, uh, but it um, it illustrates another part of, of, of this transformation of 3P. So diff trackers, that's, um, we have a shopping cart and uh, for performance reasons, um, we, um, having this collector of, of update statements. These are actually MongoDB requests uh, so that uh, uh, we can bulk execute them later. So this is not a bad design. It's, it's certainly performant. Uh, the only problem is that um, we, uh, we want to change this. And now we want to test. Uh, we don't want to really test with the database. So uh, should we unit test this and like, uh, assert that we call the right uh, uh, the update with the right uh, string. Um, well, that's very brittle because uh, 
say we want to refactor, we have a more efficient way of doing the MongoDB query uh, that will fail all the tests, but maybe maybe the difference will be uh, zero. Um, also, if we want to do a new feature, as we want to do here, it becomes completely, uh, I mean, completely useless to use TDD because there is no reasonable way of specifying if I want this state in the database, then as TDD, I'll have to specify that you will have to do this pool dollar and dollar set and so on. And there's a big risk that between, between what I specify in my test and what I actually get in the database, they, they, there's no correspondence. And so I'll discover things in production later on, even though I did TDD. Now, we need another thing to be able to work efficiently in TDD. And one thing is that we could transform this piece of code so that we, um, instead of accumulating MongoDB requests, we accumulate domain events. And given those domain events, we can compute a future state of, um, uh, of the thing that we want to save in the database. And uh, we can just save that thing in the database. Now it becomes possible to TDD the changes. And our tests are less brittle also. So what will we do here? Well, in the protect phase, we just spin up a MongoDB with Docker. Uh, we insert some data, possibly manually uh, or automatically, it depends. Uh, we can assert, uh, we can run the code. And then uh, do our assertions, just reading from the database and asserting that the state of the object is what we want. So this is with full integration with the DB, possibly other services, but we are protected. The prepare phase, we replace the code, we refactor the code to replace it with domain events and a piece of code that transform these domain events either into MongoDB queries, or more likely into uh, like a new desired state that we just save in the database. And um, and now that we have prepared, we have done this change. Now we can redirect almost all the tests to test that computation logic between given this list of events. Here's the desired state. And now that we've done that we can produce the new feature uh, simply by specifying the new events that it will have to be, be emitted, uh, computing the new desired state given these new events. And we do the new feature probably without any IO, uh, without ever touching the, the database code and uh, it becomes very easy and fast to work. Okay, so that's the last example of, of a story in, in 3P. Now to uh, um, a thorough parenthesis, uh, I've talked about approval tests. There's also YMOC. Um, I'm not using it a lot, but it, it can be uh, useful in some cases in this. Uh, I'm talking about very integrated tests with external services. Sometimes that's um, uh, problematic. I've had times where every request cost uh, five cents. Uh, so, so running them several hundred times per day is, is not, uh, not a good idea for many days. Uh, the uh, the verification phase. Um, I mean, we can write mocks and assert inside in process, but it can also be very easy to uh, just capture the whole network request that was done, and, and then just verify against that. Um, in particular, if we're doing requests that are damaging data that we have set up manually. Uh, and we don't want to invest to automate that, then we can just mock that out so we don't destroy data. That's a very um, short way of, um, of isolating a test a little bit during the protect phase. Now, the, um, the workflow of, uh, of 3P is start with protecting. Uh, during the protection phase, we're mostly working with um, very high level and possibly integrated with external services test um, because the application was not designed to be able to mock out those things. And we still want to protect our factorings to the most. During the prepare phase, the, uh, we isolate the test. This can be 
either in the beginning of the preparation uh, or at the end of the prepare, prepare phase. Um, I kind of tend to delay that quite often and, and work with integrated tests until the last, very, very last moment. Uh, because the um, the longer it goes, the, the, the more sure I am of the interfaces that I will create that allows me to isolate. Uh, so if I do that later, I have more knowledge, and so I'm more likely to be correct the first time. Whereas if I do it before, uh, I might make a mistake that will cost me some, some changes later. But I mean, it, uh, it depends on uh, each story. And in the produce phase, we're mostly working with uh, isolated tests. And this is like we're in a normal workflow. If we compare um, 3P to a test last approach, um, I think there is one big disadvantage with this approach because while it uh, certainly allows us to have a more uh, efficient investments in refactoring and so on, it certainly allows us to have a lot more feedback. Uh, so I think there's one reason that uh, will still um, make a lot of people not do it. It's um, in 3P, we have an impression of no progress in the beginning for quite a long time. You know, when we're writing the tests and when we're refactoring, we're not really working on the new feature. In the end, it goes very fast. Uh, but versus the test last, we we it, it's. We get a lot of feedback because we um, we change the code and we try to implement this. And it almost works, you know. And then you have this long piece of time where you're where you're stabilizing the code and you maybe writing the test after. But at least you had the impression of of going very fast in the beginning. Uh, so I think that's one barrier. Well, I don't have an answer to that barrier. Now. One thing we could think that, okay, if we do that in every story, uh, will it not take years to get out of legacy and have a good state of the project? Well, uh, no, no, not really. Uh, it's surprising how fast it goes. And there, there's a statistical reason why this is always surprises is how fast it goes to kind of uh, put a project back on track. Uh, the the reason is that if we look at how many times each file in a project and each function in a project is changed, it turns out that there is a very small amount of files that uh, get the most modifications. So if we were able to uh, concentrate our efforts in this piece of code, then for a relatively small investment, we're going to spend a lot of our time uh, developing in, in, in clean code. So, yeah, um, be confident. Now, um, sort of start of the wrap up. When is it useful to to three P? Um, given that it, it kind of maximizes the return on investment on refactoring and tests, uh, it does this in a progressive fashion, uh, and and then it associates every action with every improvement with the story. So it's it's useful to do it when we want to improve the code, but the tests are lacking. So that's the best place to write those tests and, uh, and refactor this code uh, now that we have tests for it. Um, when we want something progressing, if we don't want to spend a month or two on, on a rewrite, um, possibly with a risk of delaying, um, or even like a, a few days to rewrite a piece of code. It's you can kind of stop anytime at any state of refactoring, uh, and it's possible to introduce on very uh, intervene on very very small things. It's also possibly the only way when we have a, when the code is the specification when you cannot do TDD to replace something because you don't really know what all the cases are. Um, and um, and it's certainly a way of, of of changing the code without almost any risk of bugs. And this is probably the thing that is most appreciated that that people notice at first that oh my god okay it took some time but uh, it, there was just no bugs and still you changed the the, the code completely. Um, that's um, 
that pleases a lot of uh, stakeholders. So the other side to this is when not 3P, um, it's, um, it's a bit similar, but um, uh, when it's better to just replace with new code, yeah, I don't know, maybe we want to write a new service that is not in process and maybe in another language, uh, 3P is not the thing. Um, when the when you know all the specs, um, when you can just write the specs and 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 uh, and TDD it, and why not? It's just not progressive though, uh, so it's a kind of big bang replacement. Um, it happened to me in one project when the team learned to do this, but the there was such a lack of ambition what to do with the refactored code that they couldn't find the the opportunity of what they wanted to refactor in which way. Um, I don't really know what happened there, but I kind of had a feeling that you kind of have the, a bit of ambition to what are we going to do with, with the new great code that we write? Uh, they were probably so used to having very, very small stories that, uh, that did almost no changes. And, and, and probably their clients didn't count on it anymore to be able to uh, do any new big feature. I don't know. Those are guesses. And also, there's not every improvement can be linked to a story. 3P is improving things uh, in adjunction to a story. Now, um, one last thing, which is um, linked to improving projects, but it's not sp specific to 3P, uh, which is smaller is more. Like the smaller the pieces you have, the easier it is to fit them. The more you can fill your jar, or if we look at this as time, uh, like the rocks being big chunks of time and the sun being small chunks of time, uh, it's much easier to fill the time in a project uh, with things when they're small. So if we were able to do uh, 3P in small increments, uh, refactoring in small increments, uh, small improvements, then it would be uh, we would actually do a lot more of them and we would have a produce in a better state. So one of the tools for this is uh, uh, the Mikado method, which uh, kind of allows us to do any huge refactoring uh, with uh, going through many, very, 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 very small uh, stable steps. So this is a really nice thing that um, it's a quite a formal method. Uh, but once you've practiced it a few times, it kind of becomes second nature. I really recommend it. And there's um, a lot of resources on the internet on this. And now to do a final wrap up. Um, so if we do something, if, if we have better uh, return on investment of something, we will automatically do more of it. Uh, if we need um, approval from stakeholders, they are probably better versed investments than us. And if we can do it in that way, we're more likely to get their approval if we need it. Now, uh, if we do test and refactoring uh, just in time, we have better return on investment and we learn better. Um, so doing this is gonna lead to better code. There is this aspect of, of uh, waiting until the last moment, uh, accumulating knowledge to know what is, are the best or most valuable refactorings. Um, so the, the concept of deciding late, which exists in Lean, uh, which I don't think we, I certainly didn't exploit that uh, a lot. And, and I kind of did a lot of refactorings because I, I saw it, I wanted to do it, but um, maybe it should, um, I've learned to, to wait. And what, I've, what I do to wait is that um, instead of uh, looking at the refactorings I can do after a story, I look at the backlog that we have. I look at the, what we're going to do next week and the next month uh, to see that, OK, what code is these stories going to touch? And what improvement could I do that will ease these stories? And then and that's the almost the only refactoring I do in projects now. Now, um, 3P allows for massive incremental, incremental refactoring. 
it it makes it possible to do TDD in any legacy project because we do that uh, we do a change locally we redesign locally and so it becomes not only possible but also interesting to do TDD. Uh, 3P is safe. Uh, it 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 clearly it's quite easy to do 3P and not have any bugs, and that is really key because one of the things that probably a lot of us is doing is that we we're advocating for use of tests and doing TDD and, and investing in quality and stuff like that. But I I used to do that like okay, do it and in six months uh, you will see it's much better. But six months is a really, really bad feedback cycle. And I just didn't have a better response to that. I knew it was a bad feedback cycle, but um, it certainly doesn't allow for experimentation. So you kind of have to know if TDD is going to be good for you. You won't try an experiment of six months. But with 3P, you can do an experiment for a few days, maybe a few weeks. Like, you can continue doing... Um, coding without tests uh, for all the other stories. Just take one story, you do it in full 3P, maybe you spend three times as much time, four times as much time, doesn't matter. You will get a feedback on, does the code get a lot better? Do we like it like that? And we will get a, uh, a sense of, did any bugs slip through? Did we introduce any bugs? If we introduce a lot less bugs than normally, then we have the confidence and we have the motivation and we have the inspiration to try this on another story and just try to increase, decrease the 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 three hundred percent increase in time that I spent on this story. Um, you know, so we, we get confidence in investing more in training our skills of refactoring and testing. And it becomes possible to test. It becomes possible to experiment. Is this helping us? And we can evaluate. What do, you, what do you think? What do you think? Does it seem interesting? Yes, no. We don't have to convince people anymore. They can just try and see. And finally, working in small batches is uh, is another key to having great projects. Right. So that's uh, that's all I have. We're almost uh, on time. Yes, totally. Wow. What an informative session. I enjoyed it a lot. Uh, personally, I could really resonate the part when you said that we need to test just in time. And it's indeed really true that, uh, I mean, if testing takes a few minutes now, uh, it will take a few hours at the end of the story. So testing in time saves time. And also the good thing with testing uh, in time, I think, is that uh, you know we have the most recent domain knowledge of the code when we write it and not one week later. And since the tests are uh, the documentation of the code, we can create the best documentation of the code when we write it because we have the most recent domain knowledge. Later on, it is degraded. So I totally, uh, totally agree with that point. Great job, Johan. Uh, before we get into our questions, we have a few questions. Uh, before we get into I have I have one, uh, namely, this 3P, uh, personally, I never heard of this. So it is something that you invented yourself, this uh, acronym 3P, or maybe you learned it from somewhere. So where, where does it come from? What is, what is the origin of this 3P? Yeah, the, the name is the name is from me. Okay. Uh, it's, it's um, I, I, I created a name for it because that makes it easier to communicate this way, way of doing. Uh, and I'm I'm not aware of another name for it, uh, but um, but yeah, that's um, okay. Great. Yeah. yeah, it's my first time to hear it, but not the last. I think totally. So uh, let's see your questions. We have a few, few, few questions. Uh, first of all, let's see. Let me. We can remove this for now, and I can put this question. The first one. Uh, from uh, one of us. Mm, which approval testing tools libraries do you use recommend? Which other testing tools and uh, libraries? Um, for this, I, I mostly use uh, approval testing uh, for doing this. Um, I, uh, I think there are tools that could be developed where we could discover that it would more kind of even more um, automate the record and uh, and replay version of it 
Uh, I haven't invested time in that because uh, I, I end up working in many, many different languages and, and I don't just uh, investing time in, in writing a, uh, something that is, is, is not going to pay back for me. But um, um, I can feel that the tooling can really improve in this way. And um, yeah. So I have a follow up uh, question for, for that one. So does that mean when you do approval testing, uh, do you just uh, manually, I mean, okay, write a test, uh, run and sa save the result, or are you using some specific tools or libraries depending on the language? No, um, well, some languages you can have a, a approvals accept as a command line, like in, in uh, JavaScript, you can just uh, uh, automatically approve the run. Uh, you kind of have to inspect them anyway, you know, but uh, uh, there is um, sometimes uh, I was working in Golang a few time uh, a while ago, and um, we had a lot of approval tests, uh, not not for legacy, but we were do generating documents, and it was just the best way of of searching a lot of a lot of the assertions. So we have hundreds of tests uh, that asserted big documents, and uh, at some point we had to reprove. We made a change that changed all the tests. And, and so we wrote a command line tool that would just uh, approve them. So that, that's not an interesting subject. Uh, how, do you, how do you make approval tests maintainable? Um, but um, let's talk about that if we will have time. All right, uh, great addition. Thanks a lot for the answer. Let's jump on to the next one. Mm, yes, how to handle non-determinism in approval testing. For example, suppose you record input and output, but the system has non-determinism. For example, due to system time, random number generators. Mm -hmm. What is your take on this? Yeah, the, um, uh, the easiest way uh, is if we can uh, either use a result printer or the concept of scrubbers in approval tests. So not all versions of approval tools Tests have scrubbers, but these are they are basically just um, regex parsers. So if they see a date, they will replace it with date one. You know, um, if they see a different date, they will replace it with date two. And so the next time you run it, it's going to be the same, even though the date changes. Uh, but th they, it's it's subtle because if they see the exact date one again it will replace it not with date three, but date one. So uh, I think that's kind of uh, brilliant. Uh, that really solves a lot of things. The same things with UIDs. So um, that kind of gets taken care of. Um, and another option you can do is um, result, uh, do, you know, result printer. So you can kind of remove some properties of the, of the result before you stringify it, and, and then then you solve it. And then the last thing is, of course, you can change the things so that you will actually inject the time into the application. Um, that's, uh, I mean, you have to do some changes to the application maybe before you have tests, but um, yeah, it's Absolutely. a small application. To introducing a dependency for mm -hmm. that and uh, injecting and mocking it out, yeah. Yeah, there, there's also the classical versions of uh, differential assertions, like, like you can do diff on before and after and stuff like that um, um, to remove those uh, kind of um, problems also. But, um... mm -hmm. Valentina, we don't hear you, maybe. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, I want to say uh, this is definitely an interesting topic because a common challenge might be uh, let's say someone he has a REST API, have a, a database, and maybe there's a REST API method to uh, place a new order, and then that one will generate a random uh, order uh, ID. I mean, the rest of the stuff will be the same, the products mm. that are ordered and the, the calculation, but essentially when we record so for the same input, we record the output once, we record the second output, and they are basically the same for everything except uh, for that non-deterministic ID. New ID, yeah, yeah, exactly. Mm. And 
this voting might lead to our last question, I mean, last from the audience. Uh, it, it, I think it's related because you mentioned these uh, scrubbers. And here we have a question from Elias that uh, do you have examples of uh, scrubbers? Example of scrubbers? Yes. Uh, so d date and UID, those are the only ones that I've, I've used. Uh, but I guess you can write your own. But, um, hmm? So namely, we can use scrubbers for things which are non-deterministic. Is that true? Yes. Uh, yeah, I guess Anything that's a good else? way of framing it. Yeah. And the, I mean, you, you can, what I used before I discovered scrubbers was that I, I, I deleted that part or I've replaced it with the date, you know, but then yeah. all the dates were the same. This adds the feature of uh, actually I'm adding an ID to that, but, um, but uh, standardizing that ID from run to run. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, th th this is good that you mentioned scrubbers and maybe you could give us a practical example. So let's say we had that uh, application, uh, an e-commerce application, and there's that method, uh, submit a new order, which mm -hmm. and we have that order created. And in the response, we have that auto-generated ID, which differs from run to run. What would happen if we uh, used scrubbers there? It would uh, it would make you it would um, replace it with UID one, right? And um, now, um, uh, what could be an example of many UIDs? So uh, yeah, let's take the the receipt example. Uh, maybe we had uh, on that one we had the date of. Imagine we have. Um, the data at several places in that receipt, right? Uh, then it would maybe have the date when we came to the place and we passed our order and we have the date when we paid. Uh, and the date when we paid is in, at the top and the bottom. And in between is the date when we arrived. It would then replace with, in the top would have date one and in the middle would have date two and at the bottom we would have date one. Mm -hmm. Great, that, so that's for yeah. the first run, and then when we uh, run it again, would it again do replacements date one, date two, date one? Exactly, because it would just look at, okay, so I, I have a date here, I'll just replace it with, with one, and then it would uh, remember that I had placed one, it would place two, but then as it remembered which was the date it replaced with date one, it would recognize that it's the same date again, so it will replace it with date, date one again. Mm -hmm. uh, so yes, in that case, we, we could say the kind of, I guess, protection against regression bugs that it's offering is if in the first run, it's essentially expecting, it's doing an assertion that this date at the top should be same as the date at the uh, bottom, then in the second run, we are asserting that they are again equivalent. But if for some reason we get that it's different mm. dates, then that's one example of um, a regression bug, yeah. if that happens on a subsequent run. Yeah, and uh, and uh, also that uh, date one and date two are not the same because uh, that's what I, I used to do before. I, I I kind of replaced all the dates with uh, that, you know, or took this regex and just replaced everything with, you know, just date. Yeah, I mean, this is a really uh, useful technique and I guess part of the reason why we really went even with these questions into approval testing is that maybe not many people are familiar with it or have not used it. And then uh, some people perhaps may have tried jumping straight into unit tests without mm -hmm. any of these bigger tests, caused mm -hmm. regression bugs, and then that can cause sometimes negative uh, perception within the team or within a company uh, regarding tests. But this is essentially, um, this reminds me back uh, to Kent Beck's book and how he even wrote, how he came up, I mean, how he rediscovered TED, that there was some uh, tape and that they had the inputs and expected outputs and that very physical feeling to it. Like, yeah. it's not a class, you know, it's the ultimate uh, end to end uh, 
in a way. And here we're, we're bringing it here. It's the most uh, realistic uh, QA engineer like test, like end user mm -hmm. test. And we're able to also handle the, the, the non-determinism. So we could say that we are actually like snapshotting user acceptance testing sort, sort of, okay, excluding the UI. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but from a, let's say, at least backend uh, uh, perspective. Yeah. Yeah, and it comes to um, one thing that is often quite efficient to do when we do uh, 3P is in, in a lot of projects, we have almost no unit tests, uh, but we do have some tests that testers are using, some automated tests that have some stability problems. But but the cost of taking one of those tests and, and, and writing 20 of those tests for the modification that we want to do, this can be a Selenium test or whatever, um, that's often not very expensive at all. Just duplicating a lot of, of, of very, very high level tests. And it gives us perfect protection uh, for, for, for quite a lot of things. Um, but then as, as we refactor, then we can kind of replace those tests by, um, by more maintainable tests later. But that, that's the kind of uh, option that we didn't have when we weren't thinking of then we, when we wanted to write good tests from the start. But in fact, writing good tests on bad code is, oh, no, no, not that bad code, but in good tests on code that was not uh, designed to be testable is, is almost impossible and, and quite often impossible. So better separate into spend the least amount of time just to protect. And then as we refactor, we can refactor the tests. Exactly. I mean, these are almost like black box tests, as in they are independent of code design, whereas unit tests do have certain conditions about the design of our code. Like, it has to be uh, good. Yeah. And uh, the, it's, it's, I think, it, to me, it was liberating when, uh, to starting to explore this because there were these um, forbidden parts. You know, I, I should never write a test that was not stable, that was uh, flaky. The test should be very readable. It should run everywhere and so on. Uh, but just lifting that uh, obligation, as I think a lot of us uh, do respect all these things when we write tests, uh, just because we've learned to do that and and. And it turns out that it's quite good. It's quite possible to to write really crappy tests sometimes. It's, it's even it's even sometimes better. Mm. I also the um, I don't know the um, there was this question about uh, approval test and and what to what to do with them. Um, I've. Uh, they are sometimes seen as unmaintainable tests. Um, to me, in on two projects, I worked a lot with approval tests. Uh, like it's it's almost the only test that I had for for those uh, projects because they were producing. One was for doing a lot of um, code as configuration, so we were spilling out a lot of configuration code and uh, and just using approval tests on what that was good. Another one was documents. And it's, it's actually quite maintainable if we do a change of workflow there. Uh, so if we split, um, if we split between I'm doing refactoring and I'm doing change of functionality or I'm doing TD, if, if we do extreme splitting of those so that uh, in order to do make a change, I kind of um, go around and I do refactoring, refactoring, refactoring to make the change much smaller and then doing that change, then the approval tests are useful for the whole refactoring part. And they are completely useless for the actual modification there. Then I might do TDD, but, but it still becomes quite maintainable if I, if I strictly put on my refactoring hat or my uh, change of behavior hat. I know that relates to your experience too. 
Uh, yeah, I like it, uh, and that, that we brought actually two separate topics. Uh, that one about separation of behavior versus structural change is something with which I like to apply in general. But it's like a, it's good that we also apply it here to to protect the protection for um, uh, legacy code as well. So I think that I found this to be quite a good. Um, I mean, relationship and essentially highlighting what is the purpose essentially approval tests, they help us do the widest form refactoring that we want even on the worst unmaintainable code base. And if we don't have those approval tests, we cannot do that refactoring uh, safely. And yeah, I guess the, the next question that might also come up from, from people is what happens when the refactoring is over? What do you do with the approval tests? Um, I had, had one example of that here uh, in this very easy feature here. Um, the first one. Um, uh, this price print that we had only approval test in the beginning, uh, but um, as we extracted the calculations function, uh, then we can kind of redirect a lot of those tests into the actual object that is calculating uh, total and VAT. Uh, so, um, in this case, I would keep approval test, one approval test for CSV, one for text, and one for HTML. Um, we just uh, have less of them because um, they are useful for textual things. And uh, well, I guess there's in the other thing here, we have also that. in all of these uh, situations um, here, because we extracted the Unicost function, then we can pull down the 10 or 12 tests that we wrote on the rest route and make it hit the, the Unicost function. And we keep one or two tests on the, on the, on the rest level. And uh, yet again, in the example of the um, diffs there, um, Yeah. All right, so the diff trackers. Um, after we've done this separation, in the prepare phase, what we did here is we replaced the logic with domain events. And, and so uh, we can have tests that, OK, in this case, we expect this and this and this domain event. In this case, we expect this and this, this domain event. And, and then we might have, uh, okay, given these domain events, um, this is the desired state of my object. We, given this start state and given these domain events, then this is my desired state. And those are all unit tests. And, and all the logic is going to be uh, right there. There's going to be almost no conditional logic in the loading and the saving. Uh, so all feature development will be in, in traditional maintainable tests. So mm -hmm. this, this is a good point. So we could say that since we've approval tests, we captured the inputs and outputs. Uh, then, uh, OK, and we finished that, I guess, um, if they help us during refactoring. And then as we extract the um, interfaces and move to, let's say, hexagonal architecture, but the behavior is the same, like the essential input and output and calculation is still the same, then those tests could be uh, essentially become sociable uh, unit tests, such as mm -hmm. tests that are hitting the, uh, the use case. So we, we yeah. actually made a use for those approval tests then even for, for unit tests. Um, and these happen to be also the most robust unit tests yeah. Uh, as well. Yeah, yeah, and I think this was also a good example, of, a visual example of what happens here is because we have uh, refactored, it becomes meaningful to test at the lower level. And uh, and so we uh, we uh, we redirect the test, most of the test to write in the protect phase during the prepare phase. So, and, and because we don't keep them, uh, then they can be really ugly. There's no problem.
great points. Uh, maybe I have a question that came to my mind about, uh, so I also have experience with working with the legacy codes and we also use this uh, approval test or characterization tests. And, uh, but also I find, I found really useful to use mutation testing to find mm. missing test cases. So my question would be, do you use mutation testing within the 3P or what is your experience uh, with this? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I, I don't. Uh, I think that's for two reasons. Um, first of all, mutation testing, the, the problem with mutation testing is that it takes time. Uh, it also sometimes uh, provide um, uh, a lot of noise, uh, like, I'm typically going to um, mutate test over a few classes, and perhaps only some functions are interesting there. So it's going to spew it, it's difficult to, to, to focus it only on the code that I want to change that I'm, I'm, I'm actually refactoring. Um, so there's a bit of noise. But the main problem is that it, because it's slow uh, and because the tests uh, that we write during the protection phase are quite slow, I mean, uh, 10 seconds or 20 seconds or even 40 seconds can be the test run time. Um, and if we multiply that by 50 because of 50 mutations, that's too much time. Or the, the, the speed of the feedback that I get from mutation testing is not good enough compared to manual mutation testing, mm. which is what I prefer. Uh, so once you've run those tools a few times, you kind of get um, kind of know the kind of mutations that can be done. And still, some of the tools don't actually do all the mutations, but uh, you can comment one line and and, and change uh, superior to um, to superior and equal. Uh, you know, remove uh, and in the if statement and stuff like that. And and it's it's very very quick to do that and and get a get a sense of uh, am I testing everything. Great point. Yeah, so manual mutation testing, namely, that's the. Yeah. Yeah. That's but, maybe I'm also biased because I, I actually, uh, I, I've always been a bit uh, disappointed with the with the tools because they were difficult difficult to configure and um, mm -hmm. yeah. there's this noise thing and and the and the, even the feedback on on unit test is is a bit long. Uh, so as the, from a developer experience point of view, um, I. I don't appreciate them yet, uh, but I do appreciate the the revelation when you use it the first time. It's like wow, <laughs> uh, you become aware of some problems that you might not have been aware of before. Very good point. Exactly. Yeah, they are far far from uh, perfect. They are also their results are too technical in my opinion. But yeah, as you said, also. In the past, uh, I also, yeah, you're right. I prefer the manual way of mutation mm -hmm. testing. So going through the given function, which I don't know, which consists of more than 50 lines of code, and I uh, manually uh, mm -hmm. mutate by well, all the mutations, and I execute all the tests uh, for the test for the given function after each mutation. So yeah, mm -hmm. thanks a lot. Uh, we have two minutes left, maybe for one short question. I don't know, Alina or Oliver, if you have something to add, would be happy to hear from you as well. Yeah, I have a short one about preparatory refactoring. So mm -hmm. I also used to work on a legacy project and I used to do, to do a lot of preparatory refactorings. Yeah. But like, yeah. I think every time I took a story, I had to prepare my field first. Uh, and I, I don't know, I, I like refactoring, that's why I like doing it. But at the same time, I wasn't very happy with this code. So I, I was thinking, does it belong to to every project doing preparatory refactoring or, or was it the problem of the code base? Um, OK, so does it belong to every project to do a preparatory refactoring? Yes. Um, I think it does. Uh, actually, I think it's it's really important and for specific reasons. I'm looking for the slides that talked about that. Um, so for one thing, we have um, this um, this Kent Beck, which is is quite known. Uh, he seems to like it a lot, right? And 
what economic from an economic point of view what it allows us to do is uh, if we compare the the kind of uh, return on investment of refactorings it's always better when it can be done as a preparatory refactoring although there are use cases where we should refactor at the end of story but the closer between the investment and the return on that investment the better we go so why, why refactor code that we're not going to need uh, to change later there is there's no value in it So I would phrase it like doing refactoring that is not preparatory refactoring, and which is not like uh, encoding knowledge and that that kind of stuff. Um, that's to me uh, quite suspicious. And one other thing I didn't say here that I talked about OCP. I think that should never be done as a non-preparatory refactoring. Um, I think the other solid principles are very dangerous to apply at the end of a story. Uh, like take even single responsibility principle. Uh, that's a it's a very fuzzy um, frontier, and it's quite easy to uh, separate out responsibilities in a way that will actually not help the next feature. So, if it's not very clear what those responsibilities are, and if it's not already very big, I think it's better to wait and, and to do that when we have to touch that feature again. Uh, same for list of substitution principle. If we introduce an interface, it's unlikely that people are going to remove it if it doesn't make sense or change it. Uh, they're probably they're likely to hack around it. Uh, so that's a, that's a big decision, I think, a big design decision. And if we can take that decision close to when we do it, we're better off. That's more safe. We have waited to gain more knowledge and so the refactoring is bringing a lot of value. And we're actually bringing a lot of value, not doing all the refactorings that are actually not completely necessary. Great. Thank you so much. Mm. Thanks for the question, Alina and Ansfer. Well, unfortunately, the time is up. Uh, yeah, what a pleasure, Johan. Many thanks uh, Thank for you. being here. It was a great pleasure. We are learned a lot. And of course, thanks a lot for Valentin, Oliver, and Alina as well. Uh, yeah, uh, learn how to deliver quality faster. Uh, thanks for everyone being here, and I wish you a great evening or day further. And uh, see you next time. All the best. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Thank bye. you a lot.